and thanks for joining us today to kick off our 2021 virtual spring meeting. Although we're sad that we can't be with you in person, we truly hope to see you next spring and even possibly this October if travel makes sense for you. We're delighted to say that this is our biggest ITRC meeting to date with over 700 registered uh, attendees for the week. And if anybody has any questions or issues with their Zoom, please use the chat to let us know. So with a full packed meeting for over the next two weeks, uh, without further ado, I'll turn the meeting over to our co-chair, Keisha Long from the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Controls. Kick it off, Keisha. Welcome everyone. And thank you for participating on our virtual meeting. And as Patty stated, we hope to see everyone face to face soon for a, another ITRC gathering. But just before, just to kick things off, I'd like to uh, go through some basics about ITRC. So Evan, if you would, please. Uh, many of you seen this before, but we just need to say it over and over again. Our ITRC purpose is to advance innovative environmental decision making. And we have been at this for over 25 years now. And our mission is to provide information, develop information resources and processes to break down barriers to the use of technically sound innovative solutions for healthy communities, economy, and environment. And this is not just blah, blah, blah. This has been an issue that was identified many years ago. Um, yes, we have the whiz bank technology, but we often don't use it because we're not sure of it or there are no pilot studies. So ITRC fills that void and that is our mission going forward. Next slide, please. Our membership is healthy. We have about over 1,200 members that have joined for 2021. And we are still looking for more members. So please go to our website to register for team. We're about 50% government and 50% industry. And uh, next slide, please. All right. Our the heart of ITRC, our teams. We have several recently com completed project teams and I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has participated on a team. I know it's a lot of work. Sometimes it's frustrating and I just have to say thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to participate, continuing to contribute continue to develop so many documents that so many people are using and being trained on and improving our environmental professionalism for today and the future. The recently completed project teams include one for a dioxane team, the strategies for preventing and managing harmful cyanobacteria, the incremental sampling methodology update team, the sustainable and resilient remediation team and the vapor intrusion mitigation team. And as you can see, several products have been developed by these groups, including web documents, fact sheets, and of course, training. Next, please. Our recently published documents include the HCB team, 14 doxane vapor intrusion, the ISM update, PFAS, and the risk communication toolkit. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that each one of these products are um, the basis for our training. To date, we have had over 4,500 people participate in our trainings. Uh, EPA's Clue Insight hosts our trainings. We do live versions as well as there are many archive versions of the classes. And we also do in-person in or have been doing in-person 
of trainings, but of course, because of the pandemic, that's on hold. But the Water Resources Research Institute, uh, specifically the HCB team, had 500 participants. Next slide, please. Here is uh, just a slide to show that there are many, many opportunities to take a class and to get training on different versions and different documents. And um, there are trainings that will be happening next week all the way through the end of the year. So to actually be able to see individual training courses as well as to register, please go to our website is itrcweb.org. Next, please. Our 2021 project teams and those who were listening in on, on our pre-conference uh, recording, there are many different teams that you can participate on, including uh, the extension of the HCB team. They're focusing on benthic um, bacteria. There are microplastics, the environmental data management best practices team, the hydrocarbon team. And uh, starting in July, we will have our optimization of pump and treat systems and our quest um, team, which will be focusing on training, particularly for those who are just starting out in the environmental field. PFAS and the soil background and risk teams will be continuing. Uh, we have six teams that will be ongoing and two new ones. So again, please go to our website to register. And next slide. And it is my pleasure to introduce our new ITRC co-chair. is Randy Chapman. He's the environmental manager for the Petroleum, Petroleum Remediation Program in Virginia. He's been an active ITRC member since 2012 and a board of advisors member since 2018. He served as the team leader liaison and his term will be from 2021 to 2024. And his term actually started April 1st. And as you all know, um, he was selected based on a majority vote of the ITRC membership. So, Randy, if you would please give us some inspiring words. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Keisha. Um, uh, again, my name is Randy Chapman, and I'm a petroleum program manager here with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. I want to thank everybody for attending uh, this 2021 uh, virtual spring meeting. Uh, yeah, it's a lot different for all of us, but I want to thank you for, uh, for tuning in. Um, I want to thank everybody who voted for me. Uh, you know, thanks a lot for those who did not vote for me because they didn't know me or they do know me. Um, I hope to be able to, over the next couple of years, to uh, gain or regain your trust. But before I get into, uh, you know, talking about our next speaker and passing off to that, I just want to talk to you a few minutes about uh, our vision, our uh, thoughts about looking forward. And I'm going to make a request to, um, to some of you. And um, specifically, you guys know, as you know, was talked about here, we're a state-led organization. We are an organization of volunteers. The stuff that we do is through volunteer action. We're not getting paid to develop, to write, to call, to send our you know spend our times together, to to collaborate or you know to come to consensus. We are all volunteers, and since 1996, we've got over a hundred documents that this organization has published. We've got all sorts of training materials, as you saw from that um, that slide. We've got fact sheets, training materials. You know, we have all sorts of things that are here to help all of us who are in this industry, whether we're state, whether we're um, industry, we're academic, or whatever, to help us move forward and address these environmental concerns. And we've faced a lot of them. And so, you know, to, if we were in all in the room together, let's say, you know, if, when we're up in um, the last time we all met, I would ask you to all look around and give yourselves an applause because you are the people that allow us to do what we've done in this organization to succeed. Now, that being said, things change. Things, I mean, every, every entity, every organization, every issue evolves. And one of the things that we've noticed over the last few years, uh, some of the topics that we've begun to deal with, some of the topics that ITRC has begun to address 
and you know put to get together documents and fact sheets are things that some people may consider to be outside of the normal you know remediation type of topics i mean it's you know keisha went through and looked at all the teams that we've just completed and the ones we currently have we're now dealing with some emerging issues where we've dealt with you know the one four dioxane the pfos the microplastics things that aren't really probably something that most of us deal with on a regular basis or have any familiarity with, but they are an environmental concern. And you, we just finished a document on sustainability and resilience. Um, we've got a new team on environmental data management. As was talked about in the, uh, the, the pre-session, these are issues that we're still facing. These may not be the traditional remediation topics, but they're still environmental concerns that all of us, not only in this industry, but you know, for the nation and what we do and what you know, things that we have to deal with. And one of the things that we've noticed um, is that, you know, and, and this is all human nature, it's fine, we all understand that, and I'm the same way. We're all comfortable in our own um, you know, silo, in that comfort zone of the things that we know and that we don't know. And so specifically here, this is where I'm gonna be talking to um, my state counterparts, because that's what I am, I'm a state employee, lifelong state employee. I'm going to ask, and I'm making a request to our state employees, that yes, I recognize that some of these topics may not, you may feel to be outside of your realm of expertise or your realm of knowledge or your comfort zone. But I'm asking and challenging you to still be actively involved, even though you may not feel that you are the subject matter expert. And most of us for these things aren't. I am not a toxicologist, but I've learned more about toxicology this last couple of years than I thought I would ever would but I'm still not a toxicologist, but I get enough of it to understand about the implications that these documents and these issues have on all of us. As state workers, we have to deal with the public. We deal with the people that we represent, the people that we work for, our local citizens, the community, the city, the state. So these are issues that you know we have to face and we have to deal with. So I'm asking from one state employee to the other, to stay actively involved. It may not be a topic or may not be a team that you feel directly relates to what you do, but if you have the opportunity and ability through your management and your supervisors to stay actively engaged and be on the team, I ask that you do. And if you can't, maybe you can help find somebody in your agency who does that, who may not be you know, aware of ITRC or have never been involved with it, but to get them involved in that this organization and on that team and part of that subject, because all of this stuff helps all of us. We have free training, we have free information, and that can only help all of us as, a, as an industry, but as a group, as a nation, move forward. And so, it, and maybe there's not even somebody in your agency who's that subject matter, that person who would be dealing with it. Maybe there's a sister agency. And so, again, I would ask that you start reaching out, you network, you try to find those people that can help maybe address that issue, not only on your half, and I apologize for the cat behind me, but you know, to help us all do that. So my challenge to you is, and my request from one state employee to another, is to look beyond your comfort zone, to, to, to think about being involved, even for those teams and I, you know, um, issues that you're not completely familiar with, or to find somebody who is. Now, on the other hand, for the industry folks, guys, we could not do this without you. You are, many of you are subject matter experts. You have some of the technical expertise and, and the knowledge that we on the state level don't, but we from the state, we see it from our policy. We see it from our procedures and our guidance and our regulations. So we are critical, but we are all critical together. Industry, state, academia, stakeholders, everybody. Our federal partners, incredibly important to all of us. So what I hope to do over the next couple of years is one of my uh, roles is the co-chair is to be involved with the strategic decisions and the management and the growth of the ITRC organization. That's an ongoing task. There's a lot of things that come into it. I get we're all volunteers, but um, this is a great organization. I've had, I've met some incredible people since I've been involved since 2012. I uh, continue to look forward to doing this. And I, you know, I hope um, that I live up to uh, what you, um, uh, hope for me. My door, if we were here in person, I would say, you know, my door is always open. I have an email. Give me a call. Give me an email uh, if you have any questions. And if I can't answer the question, I'll try to find somebody in our organization who can. But uh, again, thank you very much for voting me in.
And um, I look forward to working with everybody again. So now I'm gonna pass it on back to, um, to Keisha Long to talk about our panel discussion with uh, incorporate environmental justice into decision-making. Thank you, Randy. And thank you for those words and taking my call to action to heart. That's very good. And before we start with our EJ panel, I want to get an indication from Evan or Pay that our panelists are here. Myra, Sean, and Conchita. Yes, all three are here. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Again, um, welcome everyone. I am Keisha Long. I am the Environmental Justice Coordinator here in South Carolina. Uh, our agency is the Department of Health and Environmental Control. And I will be your moderator for this particular panel. And today we will be discussing environmental justice. And we will be hearing from three esteemed panelists. We have Mara Reese from South Carolina, Sean Moriarty from New Jersey, and Conchita San Nicolas Titano from Guam. And I practiced that, so there. <laughs> These agencies are, are all in different stages in their EJ journey. The panel will focus on sharing their experiences working on EJ in their state or territory and what lessons they've learned so far especially those that may be helpful to other states and territories. Representing South Carolina today, we have Myra Reese. Myra is the Director of Environmental Affairs at South Carolina DHEC. As a member of the DHEC team for more than 30 years, Myra has dedicated her service to several national organizations, including the US EPA's Clean Air Act, Advisory Committee, E-Enterprise Leadership Council, and the Environmental Council of the States, where she currently serves as the treasurer Secretary. Also, we have representing New Jersey, Sean Moriarty. He's the Chief Advisor for Regulatory Affairs to Acting Commissioner Sean LaTourette at New Jersey DEP. Sean leads and manages the New Jersey DEP's internal legal team and serves as its general counsel on all matters of regulatory compliance and rulemaking. He is a member of the commissioner's executive team providing input on priority initiatives that include climate change and environmental justice. Representing Guam, we have Conchita San Nicolas Titano. Conchita is the division administrator of the air and land division at Guam EPA. Conchita has been with Guam EPA for 29 years and has been working as the air and land division administrator for over 22 years. She oversees the air program, pesticides program, hazardous waste program, and a solid waste program. So Myra, if you could start us off, please, and talk about EJ efforts in South Carolina and any challenges we've encountered along the way. Will do. And thank you, Keisha. And I am setting my timer right now. Um, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to join this conversation today. Um, as Keisha will tell you, I'm very passionate about environmental justice and I'll kind of provide um, some background on uh, what I felt like were very strong uh, influencers on our commitment um, to environmental justice. And so um, if you would go to the first slide, please. Um, and I will say being an officer for the Environmental Council of States, um, I was very pleased to see um, where we um, uh, made environmental justice a priority. And it's obvious that all the states or many of them have different approaches to addressing environmental justice. The way that South Carolina views environmental justice um, is, is sort of like this. It's it's, um, you know, envi some environmental contamination or environmental issue may have brought us to the table, but um, we view environmental justice as an opportunity for community revitalization. It's taking a step back and looking at all the challenges that our underserved communities have and bringing partners to the table and, um, and addressing environmental justice that way. And I think that's the reason why our view 
is maybe a little bit different is because of our experiences in the past. And, and really our story began 20 years ago. And this is really, um, I think, uh, an example um, when you think about, like I mentioned, that your, your commitment and how you live your lives are based on your experiences. We had an experience um, involving one of our community leaders um, that I felt like was um, life-changing or agency-changing for us. And the gentleman's name, you may be familiar with this, um, is uh, Harold Mitchell. Um, and if you, uh, you want to Google um, after the conference, Google the word Regenesis Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Harold Mitchell. Um, Harold was um, uh, started yeah, off as, as, as a community. I hear some background noise, Keisha. Okay, all right, you got it. Um, Harold um, was just living in a community, but living in the conditions where there were several chemical plants, brownfield sites, and uh, folks were very concerned about their health and, 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 and the environmental contamination issues. And Harold's approach was really to address it and uh, tackle it in a collaborative problem solving way, a collaborative method. And so um, his approach now and just his ability to start off addressing this issue in, in the er early days, he was able to um, obtain an EPA grant. I think uh, the grant was probably about $20,000 and today has leveraged it up to about 300,000 for his community. And a community that no longer has some of these environmental risks, but a community now that is thriving it has health care. Uh, they've addressed job issues and so many things. And when you just it, when you think about the power of environmental issues, addressing those and 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 bringing partners together to take a broader approach, it's just amazing. So um, I will say that this is an example of you know we always talk about the culture of the organization starts at the top and the leadership, and it does. But this gentleman, as a community leader, really shaped our culture of our agency in a significant way and still works with us and other leaders, environmental justice leaders, not only across South Carolina, but nationally and internationally as well. Um, next slide, please. So there's really two, two areas that I talk about when I talk about our program. Uh, one is more of an organizational structure and the other is the culture. But just to give you a little bit of feedback on the organizational structure, um, I've been in this position for about five years now. Um, and my experiences, most of my uh, experience with uh, South Carolina DHEC was on the front line uh, as the director of one of our regional offices. And I had lots of interaction with community folks. So I've always been very committed to listening and working with com communities and businesses at the local level and have brought that to me when I came to central office. And um, one of the fir first things that I did in my current role is to make sure that folks knew that my platform or one of my priorities was gonna be environmental justice. And as a result, I created the, the organizational structure around me, including my administration to include an EJ coordinator who was Keisha Long and also an EJ advisor who was Karen Sprayberry. Karen uh, retired from the agency, but she was instrumental in the work we did with the Regenesis Project with Harold Mitchell. And now she is one of the, um, I think one of the two state representatives on the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. Um, but the, the approach that we take is that you need some key folks who can help you reach your goals and your priorities. But to, to reach those goals, it can't just be left to a couple of individuals. So every program area within DHEC, whether you're air, land, water, waste, um, there is a community advocate, what we call a community engagement coordinator, who works as a team with Keisha Long and some of the folks with me directly in administration and we work on projects, strategic initiatives, and, and things like that. And um, so if you'll go to the next slide. And I'm coming down on time real quick. Uh, the culture, 
which I think is very important because, you know, uh, we have about, I think about 1,100 folks who work in environmental affairs and every day, every staff uh, makes decisions that can help our communities or unintentionally hurt our communities. And it's so important for them to have a good understanding of what our guiding principles are and to think about those decisions and come up with unique approaches, approaches because every community is not the same. So starting with our EJ guiding pr principles very quickly, I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of things is that one is ensuring um, uh, that EJ communities are routinely considered through decision-making processes. So that's all about our staff, what we do with training. We continually uh, highlight it as a priority. Um, two is proactively building and strengthening relationships with communities by sharing information, providing technical assistance and identifying resources uh, is so important um, for us to uh, build relationships, not when we're in a crisis situation, but work on that, work on the trust. And, and this kind of ties in with three, with number three as well, which is to proactively promote partnerships between communities and other stakeholders. One of the most significant things that we've done that I think have really helped us is we have created what we call an EJ advisory hub. And sometimes we refer to, we refer to it as EJ connections because we have a very diverse group of stakeholders, including our EJ community leaders, our businesses, our utilities, academia, all of these folks that can bring resources to the table and can listen to the priorities and the challenges that our EJ communities have. Um, and so we just recently added our South Carolina Manufacturing Alliance representatives uh, to this group, and we're excited about that. Um, and we give recognition, we called, uh, we have a recognition program to businesses in South Carolina called Community Star. It kind of goes along with our environmental excellence program. Um, if you're doing a great job from a compliance standpoint, and you're doing a great job uh, building those relationships with your communities, working with them to address those issues, we have a recognition through that program as well. And um, I will say number four is encourage and facilitate capacity building, collaborative problem solving within our communities. We're always looking through for opportunities for training grants, uh, looking for workshops. Keisha earlier today and I were talking about she's pulling together an energy 101 workshop for our EJ advisory hub and our leaders. That's going to be pretty exciting in, in about four weeks. And then lastly, just strengthening, strengthening our agency's leadership. And that really goes back to, I think the, the, the commitment and the culture of an organization really starts at the top. It's important for me, for my leadership team to be just as passionate about environmental justice as I am. And, um, and, and we do a lot of work. We don't want when certain people leave the agency that our commitment and our goals uh, don't sustain um, and, and stay with the organization. So we really put a lot of emphasis, emphasis into building a culture of environmental justice within uh, South Carolina's program. So with that, um, just greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here and I'll turn it back over to Keisha. Thank you so much, Mara, for your presentation and for your insights. And next we have Sean Moriarty with New Jersey DEP. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, Mara. And thank everyone for joining us today and inviting me to be part of this really wonderful panel. I'm going um, to give you a brief overview of the state of New Jersey's um, recently enacted environmental justice law. So in September, um, through the work of State Senator Sing Troy Singleton and our dedicated advocacy and community, um, New Jersey passed its landmark environmental justice law, the first of its kind in the nation's most empowering environmental justice legislation. And this law recognizes that because environmental standards are often formulated based on the effect pollution has upon general populations um, spread over wide geographic areas, those existing environmental laws can fail to fully consider the impacts that a concentration of pollution generating facilities can have on a local community. Ultimately, this failure has created pockets of high pollution across New Jersey, where many pollution generating facilities have become concentrated in predominantly minority and low income communities that may lack the financial and political power to shape their local landscape and avoid disproportionate as adverse impacts upon their public health and the environment. 
Um, the EJ law does what none in, in the history of environmental law has. Um, it demands that the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection not only consider the potential pollution a facility might create within an overburdened community, but consider the present environmental and public health stressors in that community, including other sources of pollution, and determine whether that facility will cause a disproportionate impact on that already overburdened community when compared to others in the state. Now that we kind of understand um, the premise of the bill, let's talk about exactly what it does. Um, as a lawyer, I like to kind of think of things in, in prongs and tests of applicability. So here we have a three prong test of applicability. First, um, the first question we ask ourselves is whether the facility in question seeking a permit from the department is one of the eight types of facilities listed in the bill. And those are what you see on your screen here. And they include um, things such as major sources of air pollution, um, power plants or cogeneration facilities, incinerators or resource recovery facilities, certain large sewage treatment plants, transfer stations or other solid waste facilities, recycling facilities, scrap metal facilities and landfills, as well as medical waste incinerators with an exception of those attendant to hospital and universities. The second question we ask ourselves is whether that facility, one of those eight covered facilities is seeking one of the subset of environmental permits um, that the department issues. And those include solid waste and recycling permits, certain development permits, those uh, seeking to develop um, in or near wetlands, um, in our shore areas or in or near flood prone areas, um, water supply or water and air pollution permits as well as pesticide permits. Um, the third question we ask ourselves is whether the facility is seeking a permit is seeking to be located or proposed to be located in overburdened community. It's if and only if these three criteria are met is the project subject to the requirements of environmental justice. Move on to the next slide. So while the bill leaves it to the department to better define facilities, and permits, along with a host of other things, um, it does provide us with a specific definition of what constitutes an overburdened community. You can see the map um, on the screen there shows the presence of overburdened communities within the state of New Jersey. Um, the bill defines those overburdened communities as census block groups, where at least 30% of households are considered low income, and that's, that's defined as at or below twice the poverty threshold as determined by the US Census Bureau, or 40% of those households identify as minority, which include identify individuals who identify as minority or members of a state recognized tribal community, or 40% of the households in that census block um, are classified as having limited English proficiency, which means lacking an adult that speaks English, quote unquote, very well, according to the Census Bureau. And a couple of key points to, to uh, address here first is the use of the word or in that definition. It really does give us the most expansive protections and ultimately leads to approximately 4.5 million people or about half of the half of the state of New Jersey's population um, living in what, what are statutorily defined as overburdened communities. The second point uh, to draw out here is the use of census blocks. Um, census blocks provide us with the most finite unit of neighborhood census data available and allows us to really drill down um, into the specific communities and, and neighborhoods um, that are affected by this by these um, pollution generating facilities. So we think taken together, the combination of the broader category of individuals with a more focused consideration of census block group um, really does best identify those individuals most in need of the added protections for local public and environmental health. health. Um, since the bill has been passed, we have been able to create a publicly available online tool that plots the location of all the overburdened communities within the state of New Jersey. And that's available on the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protections Environment Environmental Justice webpage. You, if anyone was interested, could search on an address level to determine whether a specific property is located within an overburdened community. And that's broken down um, in, with all of these criteria showing where those criteria overlap or showing where an overburdened block group might only meet one of those criteria. Um, next slide, please. So as we've discussed, uh, where the environmental justice law would apply, where you have those, sorry, pop back one. Thanks, sir. Um, actually, sorry, can you go back to, to the environmental and public health stressors? There we go, thank you so much. Um, as we discussed, where the EJ law applies, um, an analysis of the existing and new contributions to public health and environmental stressors is required. The bill does give us some specificity as to what we should be looking at when we're considering environmental and public health stressors. It defines environmental stressors to include things like concentrated and mobile sources of concentrated areas and mobile sources of air pollution, as well as the presence of contaminated sites, the presence of certain facilities, including transfer stations, 
recycling facilities, scrapyards, and other solid waste facilities. I think what's interesting here is that the law really, the law recognizes that the presence of those facilities themselves, some of the ones that are listed as the facilities covered by the bill, is in of itself, is in and of itself an environmental stressor on these communities. Um, also considers point sources of water pollution, including combined sewer overflows, which are an issue um, within the state of New Jersey. Um, it also defines public health stressors um, as conditions that may cause potential public health impacts in an overburdened community. And those, those impacts include things such as asthma, cancer, elevated blood lead levels, cardiovascular disease, and developmental problems. I think what's interesting to, to look at here and the specific um, use of the term may cause in the definition of public health stressors, what that allows the department to do um, is essentially use present conditions in a community um, to um, as essentially a surrogate for some of these conditions. So where um, there might be data issues, where there might be um, the need to be able to bring data down to a census block level, this gives us a little bit more flexibility to consider things such as um, if you're talking about blood level levels, um, the presence of lead service lines in a community, or even the age of housing stock as being indicative of a presence or a potential presence of lead paint. So we're able to use present conditions to build the appropriate points of analysis to allow us to do the, do the work we need to make that disproportionate impact analysis. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So once we've analyzed those stressors, the question becomes, what do we, to what do we compare those stressor levels to determine whether a community is disproportionately impacted um, as related to its neighbors? Um, the bill requires the department to determine whether stressors disproportion, are disproportionate to those borne by, quote, other communities within the state, county, or other geographic unit of analysis as determined by the department. So as part of our process, we're considering what those appropriate points of comparison might be. We're looking at county, state, as well as some regional maps um, and considering whether it's appropriate to separate out the overburdened communities in that analysis. So effectively comparing um, any given overburdened community block group to those non-overburdened communities as the, as the point of comparison. Also looking at whether it's appropriate to consider um, kind of the lower of state or county to make sure that we're having um, the most protective um, regulations in place as possible. I think I'll go to the next slide. So the next question I think um, what would pretty obviously leads us is what is this going to look like? And you know we're, we're still early in our process and trying to um, determine how exactly our rules are going to going to work this all out. But we sketched out kind of a very preliminary outline of a process. So along with the permit application to the department for a covered facility in one of those overburdened communities, an applicant would complete an environmental justice impact statement that would identify the existing public health and environmental stressors in the community. Subject to the criteria the department is developing as part of its rulemaking process, the department would then assess whether pollution from that facility would create a disproportionate impact on the local community by imposing additional environmental or public health stressors. The department would then assess whether through adding additional um, appropriate pollution controls that address those localized impacts, the facility can ultimately avoid imposing a disproportionate public health or environmental impact on that community. Where there is no disproportionate impact or the pollution controls would resolve such an impact, the department would be able to issue the permit. Alternatively, if a disproportionate impact exists, but the project would serve a compelling public interest, then the permit can also be issued. If a disproportionate impact exists and then there's no compelling public interest, if there's a new facility, the permit is denied. Um, the department has certain has has more limited power with regard to existing facilities, so we're able to condition um, permits for existing facilities if they're seeking to expand or if they're seeking to renew their existing Title V or major air source permits. Um, so where exactly are we now in the process? We are in nearing the end of our stakeholder process. Um, we've we've been fairly deliberate and kind of built step by step in a series of focus focus group uh, type meetings. Um, with members of our environmental justice advocacy community, community as well as from our industry. Um, and we expect to conclude that stakeholdering sometime in the next two months. Um, and then it, our expectation is that we will have a rule um, that will address all of the questions that, that are inherent in this presentation um, in the fall of this year with an effort to adopt that rule and put these, put these regulations in place um, as early as possible in the year of 2022. So that is my presentation and thank you for and it back to Keisha. Thank you so much for your presentation. And finally, we have a video from Conchita Titano. So please take it away. Half a day and good morning from Guam, where America's day begins. 
I would first like to congratulate ITRC for a successful 2021 spring meeting and thank Patty Reyes for inviting me to share Guam's work in social equity and inclusiveness, which environmental justice is a component. I will share what Guam had been planning since last year on what to do after the pandemic to create enduring social value through investments in zero waste infrastructure. In 2020, the world faced many challenges and changes. What the pandemic did was contribute or deepen social and economic inequalities. Now people faced less opportunities harder access to education, inaccessible health services, lower quality and less affordable housing, and difficulties from unemployment. During the middle of the pandemic around July of last year, I got together with my technical team from Jacobs Environmental, and we evaluated how to improve or diversify the implementation of the initiatives and projects associated with Guam's Zero Waste Plan. The plan already had environmental, climate change, and economic components, but it did not factor in the social or human component. So we decided last year to begin including a social equity and inclusiveness, SEI, component in our Zero Waste Projects. We did this to primarily broaden the coverage of our work so as to better serve our community. As challenging as 2020 was, 2020 also gave us that opportunity to remind us of what is important in our lives, to reset our way of doing business, and to reimagine what we would like our community to look like. So while we waited, 2020 also provided that opportunity for governments to make plans to rebuild their economies, improve the livelihoods of people, and incorporate infrastructure investment strategies to build strong and vibrant communities. So in planning for after the immediate threat recedes, we began thinking, now is the time to rethink how to rebuild a more equitable and inclusive island. Now is the time to reinvent a better tomorrow. And now is the time to invest in infrastructure that supports sustainable and resilient communities. So how does this all work? Well, applying SEI in Guam's Zero Waste Framework incorporates five approaches for generating social value in our zero waste projects. As usual, data is at the beginning of every project, and that data is constantly evaluated to address possible gaps in the life cycle of a project. Co-design is designing the project with the community in mind, and primarily with direct engagement with the host community. Co-design is about collaborating with stakeholders at the beginning of the project and up to the operation and maintenance of that project. Now we all know that every project costs money. Blended funding is that outcome from the collaboration with stakeholders that leads to opportunities such as public-private partnerships or leveraging funding from other government sources. Now, when you're ready to send out that RFP, bid, or RFI for the project, social procurement is requiring or giving incentives or points to that company who includes a community benefits plan in their proposal. Benefits could be that 1% to 2% commitment from the overall project costs or even volunteer hours. The social value measurement is identifying indicators that quantifies the impact to the community 
as you continue further down this diagram, it shows that this model could be used in various sectors with the collaboration with partners. The icons at the bottom of the screen represent areas where positive community outcomes could be realized in the areas of transportation, community well-being, equality and equity, housing affordability, access to vital services, and physical and mental well-being. In the interest of time, I will continue on to the next slide. In this slide, each stakeholder has a traditional role, and as part of engagement or collaboration, the roles take on a blurring of responsibilities because of shared concerns or shared value on social well-being. So as you move inwards in the, in the semicircle diagram, the objective is for the collaboration of the stakeholders to deepen further towards the intention for social well-being as a valued outcome. My time is up, so I will go over the last two slides quickly. This slide illustrates our zero waste framework and how some of the five strategies are integrated. For example, big data analytics can be found in all four areas in this diagram. And the value of data in governance is tremendous in developing institutional frameworks to support beneficial reuse, recycling, upcycling, etc. The last slide. In leaning forward, these are the next areas where we will be assessing for SEI opportunities. Under zero waste rulemaking, we are in discussions with our legislature to include a provision for grants and loans that prioritize individuals with disabilities and the aging. Under the Recycling Enterprise Zone, we are in discussions with the Guam Humanities Council to leverage funding for artists to utilize recyclable materials in art. To expand our outreach and education, we are creating 25-minute episodes for the PBS University to reach out to high school students, and we plan to convert our guidance documents into training manuals in partnership with the Guam Trades Academy to support green jobs and green infrastructure. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your patience. And in the language of my island, Dunkalu, Dunkalu Nasidzuus Maasi. Thank you and beautiful. Oh. So we're going to, into our question and answer series. And um, we have about 13 minutes, but I would like to kick off the question and answer panel with uh, one question for all three of our panelists. And it is, what do you see as the biggest challenge in developing and are implementing an EJ program or regulation? And um, Mara, could you start us off? A um, couple of things come to my mind uh, with that, Keisha, and I'm not, I guess you're talking from a state perspective, developing an e, uh, EJ. Um, I think going back to some comments that we made, um, that EJ means different things to different folks. And, and I think even within our own organization, um, some staff really get it and understand it, you know, that we need to look at, we just can't look at our standard um, SOPs to make sure that we're addressing environmental justice, that every community is unique and, and one size fits all does not work. And so we need to know our com uh, communities. We need to have our finger on the pulse of our communities and, and, and be prepared to come up with different strategies to address whatever's in front of us. So I think that, and another thing, I know people hate to hear the word resources, but I really do think for us to do an adequate job uh, as a state when it comes to environmental justice, it's important for us to have the resources uh, to be able to support communities, to provide the technical assistance, to provide other things that may be needed. All right, great. And Mr. Sean? Sure, I would, I would definitely echo. echo. Echo Myra's Myra's uh, point as well, but I'll try to just say something different for the for the interest of everyone else. Um, 
I think that there's two things. You know, this this all you know involves a culture change for most for most agencies and, and needing to understand um, that there that there's more that we can do to focus on specific communities. And part of that is 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 accurately and appropriately identifying uh, the people in those communities and, and who who are their voices and how do we understand their concerns. It's, you know, in, in the state of New Jersey, you know, there are many many large um, and, and very well run environmental institutions, environmental advocacy groups that help us to do that, but those don't cover every, every community. And we need to constantly be finding ways to, um, to get ourselves in those communities to understand the concerns of folks because one size does, definitely does not fit all. And every project um, hits, a diff hits a community differently. And I would also just add from the other side of that, um, I think, and this is inherent in probably most of the work that we all do, um, is the economic argument that comes with this. And when we're, when we're working to implement an environmental justice law that places additional restrictions on siting facilities, um, it's incumbent upon us to help folks who might, um, whose knee-jerk reaction might be that that is somehow um, going to be economically detrimental to the state to understand that it's just frankly not. And that the work that we do to improve, improve communities that have been overlooked for too long um, will over time benefit us all. And, and our goal with this environmental justice legislation is, is frankly, to, to lessen the number of overburdened communities within our state. And as we do that, um, I think we will reap, reap both social and economic rewards. And I think that that's beneficial for all of us. Great, thank you. And Ms. Conchita? Thank you. Now, when you think about EJ, most people envision cleanup of communities from Superfund sites, but really need to look at what or how do you define environment? And really environment is about where we live, where we work and where we play. So the application covers various sectors. The difficulty lies in framing how to implement it during the planning phase and visualizing the product that from that process. Also correcting the misperception that addressing environmental justice um, may slow down the planning process. If there was a way to implement it, because I'm coming at it from a government uh, perspective, obviously. So there's a regulation it, where we can include environmental justice. It will probably be in the area of procurement because there, there are already provisions in the federal grant systems that recognize women or minority owned businesses. Uh, there are preferential hiring points if you will, but from the per procurement perspective, I believe the next level would be an opportunity to include a community benefits plan uh, for, from prospective contractors. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I am looking at the chat and there's a question for Mr. Sean is, and they're asking uh, about your, when you cover your um, slide deck and they didn't see super fun sites. So is our super fun sites covered under this particular? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the law specifically calls out contaminated sites as being, as being a, a potential environmental and public health stressor. And I think we're working, working to kind of better define that as part of the regulations in terms of what that'll specifically include. I think super fun sites are, you know, what we would consider from a state perspective to be known contaminated sites are likely to be a part of that definition. Um, because we recognize that those have impacts to the individuals who live near them, for sure. And are there, uh, is there a numerical threshold to help define may cause potential public health impact? Yeah, that's another thing. That's another thing we're working on. I'm, I mean, I think, I think probably hoping you'll invite us back in the fall so we can talk a little bit more um, once we kind of make some of these decisions. But that's Thing we're, we're, we're wrestling with um, as part of our rulemaking process to determine what that threshold should be. Should it be, you know, anything above, um, above a, a given stressor level that already exceeds its neighbors? It could be that, it could be some sort of percentage. Um, we're going to be working with our, with our data experts as well as our stakeholders um, to hopefully make a well-reasoned and appropriate decision in that regard. And I am taking moderator prerogative asking a quick question. I is are these is this law applicable to present facilities or are they grandfathered in? Sure. Um, so they for any existing facility, our powers are slightly limited. So we have the ability to deny a permit for a new facility seeking 
um, to be located in an inner overburden community, you know, subject to, to going through that disproportionate impact analysis for existing facilities. Um, if those facilities seek to expand, we are able to apply that same analysis and put additional conditions on those facilities. Um, and we're talking about kind of facility-wide conditions. So we can look at things like, um, you know, where we might traditionally look at from an air or water perspective, kind of a point source emission. We'll be able to look at that facility-wide impacts. We'll be able to consider their mobile sources, their mobile on-site sources, as well as any impacts from truck traffic and other things. So we'll be able to add additional conditions there um, to try to reduce and, and in the best case scenario, eliminate those impacts. Um, absent an, an expansion, um, our, our authority is limited to renewals of major source permits. So in the federal parlance, Title V permits. Uh, um, so if you have just a kind of standard operating facility that doesn't have a Title V permit, doesn't expand, it's going to be effectively sub-regulatory threshold, but ultimately um, we'll hope to be able to address all of those facilities. All right, thank you. Absolutely. And for Mara, uh, what is South Carolina's definition of EJ and how does the state provide technical assistance? Okay, um, well, first things first, as far as the definition, um, you know, of course, we support uh, EPA's traditional definition, um, you know, that um, is, is basically the fair treatment, meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regs, and policies. In plain language, I would say here again, it's about us recognizing uh, the diversity, the uniqueness of those communities, and we keep that in consideration with every decision, every action we do. It's not just about permitting. Um, it's just, it's not just about uh, cleanup and remediation. Uh, we, we even, you know, we, we, we have conversations with our folks when we talk about uh, public meetings and public hearings. Uh, we, have the, that we have the ability now to um, overlay data and be able to show where we have gaps in broadband. We certainly do not want to have a strategy when we're talking about a new facility coming in or an expansion, anything like that. Um, we don't want to... Uh, set up a public meeting in Columbia, South Carolina, away from the community, uh, knowing what the challenges for many of our communities are with transportation and things like that, and the ability to participate, um, you know, through um, uh, virtual meetings. So we'll take extra steps by having our community engagement specialist, while our engineers are focused on the technical evaluation of projects, our community engagement team is out riding around the, the facility or proposed area, looking at the homes and the communities that are out there and having those one-on-one -on -one meetings. So overlaying all this data uh, so you have a better sense of what how what the community is like. Uh, then you shape, like you said, every project's different, every response is different, um, and and that's um, usually our approach. Um, the second question: How do we provide technical assistance? Um, we listen to our, our communities. Uh, some communities want assistance with uh, uh, more technology uh, type things. We've had some communities that have wanted to get into citizen science and do some monitoring. So we actually partner with them uh, and train them on, um, uh, you know, uh, things they need to be aware of to get the best quality data to, to set up QA, QC, SOPs, all those type things. So depending on what projects and what uh, visions our communities have, we offer up technical assistance in a variety of ways. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. I'd like Ms. Conchita to um, speak. Who do you find is speaking for the communities when engaging on EJ outreach? Thank you. Um, that would be our mayors. Now keep in mind that Guam, Guam is really a multi-ethnic community. And although we have our we have our governor and our lieutenant governor, our mayors, village mayors, essentially take on that role, that traditional role. They they have a planning council. They represent 
not only their the the overall community but also the grassroots community and they're extremely engaging whether you want them to be or not i mean they, they definitely fight for their constituents all right thank you thank you uh, that was a surprising answer <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it's an island. I mean, and, and I know that it, it, I, I'm providing information from an island, from a small community, but not only a small community, an isolated community in the middle of the Pacific that is located closer to Asia. And, and so when I, I say multi-ethnic uh, uh, community, I, I truly mean that. Uh, and so when people talk about environmental justice as a Pacific Islander, we're like, well, you know what what's what's the big big deal you know we all it's a really shouldn't it all be about people helping people and that 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 is the pacific islands perspective fantastic thank you and thank you to all of our panelists for participating i'm giving you a virtual and thank you for taking the time to speak with us on ej and as Mr. Sean was saying, there's more to come. So you are all welcome to come back and join us anytime. Anytime you invite us. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. And thank I would like you. to thank you. Also, I know the time is funky for you, Ms. Conchita. <laughs> thank you so much. And I am turning things over to Randy for awards presentations, correct? Yes, um, and two things. Um, I'm gonna come up with a, an award right now I just made up on my own and it's gonna go to Conchita because it's four o'clock in the morning where she's calling from. So she gets an award for the earliest riser and the longest distance for this uh, plenary session. So the award goes to you, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I'm used to with the swamo <laughs> so. all right and um and before i go into the awards uh thing this is exactly what i was talking about earlier i mean this environmental justice it is part of what we are going to be involved in and incorporating into our decision matrix from now on this is this is part of our environment that we live in it's a consideration that we need to make and i and i would argue that probably most of us never thought we would be dealing with this when we were sitting in our science class or, you know, physics or chemistry or whatever we do. Um, so this is this is that whole thing of expanding outside of your comfort zone, uh, be willing to uh, understand and incorporate other ideas and, and, you know, and still be involved. OK, so it's now uh, my um, my uh, uh, honor to uh, start uh, to go into the award ceremony for the first award is the ITRC Impact Award. And I'm going to pass it off to Sandra Goodrow with the uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Hello. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Well, I am so happy to be able to introduce the recipient of the 2020 ITRC Impact Award. Kate Schlosser is an incredible woman to work alongside, and the PFAS team is incredibly lucky to have her. Kate Emma currently serves as a supervisor of the Emerging Contaminant Section of the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Hazardous Remediation Bureau. And of course, PFAS is the ultimate emerging contaminant, so that is her focus. She started with the ITRC PFAS team in 2017 as writing group lead for the History, Use, and Naming Convention subgroup. And along with her co-lead, Jeff Hale of Parsons, she was known to early on to work with many of the other writing groups, ensuring the content of the text that they were putting together was accurate and represented the group's intentions and always working towards consensus. Her work has been essential at keeping the end products, including the fact sheets, the technical regulatory documents, and the training, not only on time, but up to the highest quality. And then in January of 2020, Kate Emma took on the leadership role for the whole PFAS team after Ginny Yingling stepped down, or as we know her, just Ginny. <laughs> Alongside with her outstanding contribution to the Tech Reg document, Kate Emma provided outstanding contribution to the PFAS 
roundtable webinars. This is a huge issue that Kadem just really grabbed and formed. Um, it's a newer format of training and she really did form it and uh, worked extremely hard. So uh, her leadership uh, really contributed to the quality of that type of training. Kate Emma is well known to demonstrate inclusivity and to support consensus, which can be a challenge in such a large group. In addition, she's known to be approachable, kind, and fun to work with. Kate Emma's impact on the PFAS team and to ITRC overall is so valuable, and we are very lucky to have her. So where is Kate Emma? There she is. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, so Sandra, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm very appreciative. I just wanna say thanks to ITRC, to the board, the staff and to Patty uh, for this opportunity. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have any success, uh, Sandra, you mentioned um, our leadership, but from our program advisor, Leslie Hay Wilson, um, our past uh, co-chairs, Bob Mueller and Jenny Engling, and of course my time with you, Sandra. So you guys, all the work that you've done really has just paved the way for me to switch roles um, from a subgroup lead into the current team lead. So thank you for that. And, um, you know, it's also a big thank you to the other subgroups leads. You mentioned Jeff, and I know he and uh, now Jeff Wenzel, who has stepped up in the history and use group, um, they've done a great job along with the rest of our subgroup leads. And that's the only way that I can be successful in transitioning my role. So thanks to them. Um, I can only also accept this, I think, just on behalf of the rest of the team. You know, we have a huge team of hundreds and hundreds of folks um, that have a wide variety of expertise, um, interests, and opinions. And, and um, you know, with all this ever emerging science and policy that keeps coming out around PFAS, it's really a great opportunity um, to listen and to learn um, and collaborate with this team to meet our team objectives. So thanks to the team for all their hard work. And last thing I want to say is, um, you know, before the PFAS team, I actually hadn't been um, an active member of an ITRC team. This was my first foray into it. Um, it really has been a great experience. And I have to also owe some gratitude back to our senior leadership at New Hampshire DES. Uh, for allowing me and some of my coworkers to participate on this and other ITRC teams, but it's really been a two-way street. Um, we've been able to take, you know, the network that we've made, the information that we've learned back to help further support our mission uh, back in New Hampshire as well. So thank you again for this. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you, Sandra, and the rest of our team and ITRC, because we've got a very busy rest of the year coming up uh, with a lot of great work uh, that remains to be done. So Thanks so much, and uh, send it back over to you, Randy. Well, thank you very much, Kate Emma and uh, Sandra. All right, um, next I'm gonna um, announce, I'm gonna pass it on to the presenters for the ITRC Lifetime Achievement Awards. It is uh, David Sow uh, with uh, BP. He's currently our Industry Affiliates Program Liaison on the Board of Advisors. And uh, Najee Akladis with the uh, Maine Department of Environmental Protection. He is currently our Special projects coordinator on the board of advisors. So I'm gonna turn it over to you two. Thank you. Um, hi, this is David Sal. I, I, I get the pleasure, actually genuine pleasure to introduce um, one of our two um, ITRC Lifetime Achievement Award winners for 2021. Uh, specifically, um, the, the award goes to Bob Mueller from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Um, if you've spent any time in ITRC, then hopefully you've had a chance to interact with Bob. Um, he's kind of one of those people that once he walks into a room, he fills the room. I mean, not just because he's a big guy, but he's got a big heart and a big personality and is not shy about expressing his views and his opinions about anything. In fact, you know, he'll get down to, <laughs> he'll, he'll pull you aside and tell you some jokes that may or may not be good for public, but, you know, you know, that's the kind of person that Bob is. He's, he's very personable, very open. And he's been involved in ITRC as long as ITRC has been in existence. So in, in many ways, what ITRC is today is actually due to a lot of how Bob has been involved in the organization. I think when he started 25 years ago in 1996, it was actually operating under what was called the six state MOU. It included states like New Jersey, Illinois, California, and so forth. Um, 
And of course, today we have 50 states plus, you know, territories like Guam and DC and, and other areas of, you know, um, that are, uh, you know, using ITRC products today. And that is, you know, that all started because of the involvement that Bob had early on back in 96 and worked at, you know, being a team member, a team leader, uh, a member on the board and even a co-chair. And of course has also ran some very large teams and developed new processes and new, new ways of working that ITRC is working on and including in the way we do things today. Um, he's taken on big challenges and big, big projects. Um, he was involved in the PFAS team and you know, has, has uh, you know, uh, shaped a lot of the new directions that, be, uh, that uh, ITRC has taken, formed a lot of processes and actually involved a lot of people in, in, in ITRC, not just other states, but industry. You know, he was um, part of the formation of the industry affiliates program and building that into ITRC's way of working and giving it an avenue for industry to participate on these project teams that again is one of the strengths that we have as an organization is that we bring in you know, all parts of the environmental field together to work on these really complex problems. And Bob was in that formulative part of that, uh, of ITRC to put it all together. Um, Bob actually introduced me to ITRC 23 years ago. Um, we had as part of that, um, at the time I was gonna give a presentation to the Illinois EPA, one of the six states in that MOU. And because I come from industry and the state of Illinois, Ted Dragovich, who was the point of contact for the state of Illinois, contacted Bob, asked him to come in and, you know, we have this industry guy coming in to give a presentation, give us the state perspective, because the, the MOU, you know, um, allowed for that kind of activity to occur. And so Bob gave a presentation at the same time I did on phytotechnologies, which was the project team that Bob was working on at the time for ITRC. And our presentations meshed so well together. Things that I said in my presentation, Bob confirmed, and things that Bob said, I also confirmed um, with him as well. So everything from that point forward grew into this relationship that got me involved in ITRC. And truthfully, I, I feel like I owe Bob you know, personal gratitude for the success of my career because of my involvement in ITRC and it never would have occurred without Bob. So I, I you know, I'm absolutely genuinely um, thrilled to be able to present Bob as one of the Lifetime Achievement Award winners. And I would like to hand it over to Bob to give a few words about his experiences in ITRC and receiving this Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, David, I was trying to hold it together until those last words. So, um, yeah, you know, I got involved with ITRC. Um, Bob Shin, uh, Commissioner of DEP at the time, we were involved with the six state MOU. And Ryan Segorka from New Jersey was leading a metals and soils team. And I was champion, championing a soil washing technology. And so I joined that team. You know, you know really, what the, immediately the networking capability of ITRC, you know, my Involvement with industry up to that point usually was across the table, pounding our fists on the on the table, and um, certainly didn't have contacts with other states you know, or no experts in other states that could have dealt with, with similar problems. So, so honestly, uh, you know, the, working with these teams, uh, you know, allowed allowed this networking for me personally, and it, it definitely uh, was valuable to my position at the state. You know, if, if someone came to me with a with, with an issue and I could identify an ITRC person or another team, it certainly uh, was to my benefit. Um, David, uh, I, I, all I had to do was hear him talk for 10 minutes and I knew I needed him on the uh, on the FIDO team. And um, he was involved with a lot of training and we, I think we did 12 or 13 cities. David paid his way all around. And uh, when I introduced the AAP, we had a, a really, uh, really uh, permanent discussion about you know, the amount of money that BP Amico had invested in him and how could we ask BP Amico for, uh, you know, for, for additional money, but somehow, uh, somehow I convinced him or he gave up, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but anyway, um, it's interesting because I look at uh, Michael Smith, who's coming on after me with an award. I think he and I were the total impetus behind our uh, project lifestyle cycle that we have now, because I, mean, I led the FIDO team uh, David, if you remember, uh, 
somebody wrote a really big section on constructed wetlands. So hey, let's have a constructed wetlands team. Let's have a mitigation wetlands team. Let's have uh, alternative covers for landfills and just kept going. And the same thing happened with, uh, with, with Michael and, and Dean Apple. I remember very, uh, very acutely when we decided not to fund the Dean Apple team the next year, I knew Michael would be upset, so I invited him to the board. So you, you know, you keep your uh, keep your enemies close. But uh, um, Michael did a, did a great job with that. Um, you know, and talk about networking. Uh, maybe you'll remember uh, September 11th, 2001. Um, we're all down in Austin, Texas, and all of a sudden we see what's happening in New York City. Um, we had a, a a meeting plan for that day. We we, we did get the meeting in. Um, we sort of took a lot of breaks to see what was happening, but at the end of that uh, meeting, everybody was lining up ways to get home because we probably had 60 to 75 people who all had to drive home. And uh, I know we sent people in every direction and, you know, cars uh, you know, full uh, of stuff, but it was definitely a, a, build, a team building thing there. And talking about networking, I think one of my first teams, uh, people came into the room and here was a state person and an industry person who on the Friday before, we're screaming at each other. And here now, you know, they worked perfectly together on the team, just, you know, from what I've always said, leaving your, your hats, you know, outside. Um, so, again, um, you know, thank you all. I mean, I know that, um, you know, while I wasn't necessarily an expert on every team that I led, it was certainly, uh, I felt like I could, you know, herd the cats and, and get people, drive people to consensus, whether I did it for, through a big presence in the room, uh, David, or not, uh, certainly try. But uh, as uh, as Sandy said, Sandra Goodrow, I want to thank her for, I think she was involved with you know, nominating me. And um, I do want to thank her. I want to thank Leslie Hay Wilson for uh, for all the work on the last few teams. And initially Steve Hill, who, uh, who was our program advisor for a lot of the beginning uh, teams. So. Uh, here she is taking me to 40 states, three international trips. So uh, it's been a good run. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Is it my turn now, uh, Randy? It is your turn, Naji. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, not as good as uh, talking off the top of my head like you guys. I prepared remarks here. And uh, I'm going to add a little bit of humor to it because uh, you guys made me sad a little bit. <laughs> okay, so uh, I would like to start with Mike's participation history with the ITRC, which spans about uh, over two decades. Uh, first, as a team member for all the DNF teams, as well as many other teams. Uh, Mike has brought significant section of many, many of ITIC guidance documents. And his technical expertise in geology was a great asset for the teams he participated in. Mike also was a co-team leader with me on two teams, but we, we hammered him with all kinds of writing assignments. So he was writing like crazy. He also was uh, served on the board of uh, advisors, ITRC board of advisors for from 2004 to 2011. So he told me that, I'm not sure. Uh, he also helped with uh, internet-based training for many, many years. Uh, he traveled to conferences around the country for presentations and short courses on the ITRC products. Uh, Mike believed in the ITRC mission and, and our contribution to the environment. He talked about the <clears throat> he talked about the ITRC every chance he got at the ITRC booth conference at uh, conferences on a plane to uh, other passengers or just bragging about the organization before and after he presented at conferences. Here I'm going to get his wife, Lynn, in trouble now. Uh, his wife, Lynn, once told me that she saw him talking with his four-year-old grandson about the ITRC. He was showing him pictures and graphs 
from documents of forbid family stories. Oh, that's bad. His, his grandson went to sleep really fast. <laughs> uh, not only did he accomplish great work for the ITRC, uh, Mike contributed a lot to the state of Vermont during his 33 years employment there. He worked on many complex sites and he drafted some of the Vermont's environmental regs. I was told, I'm not sure. <laughs> he was a great mentor to many geologists in his state and he used his expertise and experience in Vermont to help uh, colleagues from other states. I just want to add a little note here uh, uh, about Mike. Uh, the complex sites Mike worked on in Vermont were not really exactly complex. They became complex after Mike got involved in them. I nicknamed him Mike the Bonehead Geologist from Vermont. Of course, I'm just kidding. I want to congratulate Mike on his lifetime Achievement Award, and I'm honored to call him my friend. Thank you. Your turn, Mike. Oh boy. <laughs> you hear me? I hope you're embarrassed now, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Um, thank you, Najee. Uh, when I first got this, uh, Richard Speece called and told me I won this award. I was speechless, which is something I certainly can't say for Najee. <laughs> But no, it's it's it is a real honor. I've, I've gotten so much more out of ITRC than I've been able to put into it, and we've been able. It's, it has helped our state. Um, it's helped a lot of states in the country, and it's been a real privilege. Uh, I do remember the trip. Bob mentioned the trip back from from Texas after 9/11, and we went with three other people. Um, and being good environmental people, when they offered us a, a Lincoln Town Car, we said no and took the Ford Contour. And, and the drive from, from Texas to New Hampshire to actually to Boston to New Hampshire to Vermont, I, I regretted that the entire way and complained about it the entire way. So people were kind of sick of me. But uh, no, I do, I, it has done so much for me. And, and as Bob said, we've gotten many states. Uh, it's also had people who are experts actually will talk to me. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't. I can, I can call people up um, to the networking here and get hold of people very easily. It's been a great. Great organization. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to get a big clap for everybody now. All right. Um, so uh, thank you, Bob and Mike. And now I'm going to uh, wrap it up and turn it over to uh, Patty Reyes to uh, discuss our um, departing uh, co chair, Richard Speece. So go ahead, Patty. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And last but not least, one second, we have uh, we have one more award to give out, and that is to our former, now former co-chair. It's bittersweet to provide this award to Richard. Uh, Richard Speece is from the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Richard started on our board uh, as the team leader liaison, and then for the past three years, he's been one of our co-chairs with Keisha. But due to the term limits, Richard is moving off the board to be the new team leader for the, for the new hydrocarbons team. But during his tenure as co-chair, Richard led us through many, many major milestones, including our new five-year strategic plan. He was an integral part of that PFAS team with the AFFF uh, section heading, as well as uh, many of the successful challenges, getting us through successfully all the challenges to COVID the last year and really putting us on path to future successes. So I thank you, Richard, for all your leadership. It's been uh, my personal joy to work with you each week and we are forever grateful for your support, no matter what Aswamo told us when you started on the ITRC board. But thank you so much. And Richard, uh, would, like, uh, would you like to say a few words? Sure, I'll try and keep it brief as any good outgoing chair should. And I'll start with uh, Patty and Keisha. I really like your background. There's Cherry blossoms, they're beautiful. Um, but it's been such a pleasure to be on the board. Um, it's it's a, an incredible group of dedicated, 
hardworking individuals. And I do like working with people who are dedicated and hardworking. Um, some of the smartest people I've ever known are members of ITRC. And much like Michael Smith, I've learned much more from them than I've ever brought to the organization. Um, it is hard to come on and speak after Mike and Bob, after everything they've done for ITRC. It's pretty incredible. But uh, I do know that ITRC is in great hands uh, with the leadership from Patty and her staff, and also with uh, Keisha and Randy and the rest of the board. Um, uh, it's really nice to have Keisha and Randy taking over for me. Um, they're certainly going to do a much better job than I did, I'm sure. And, uh, and that's great. That's what we need is good leadership. So uh, congratulations to them. And as my departing remark, I will forever be known as the co-chair of COVID. So thank you again, and uh, I will continue to support ITRC in every way I can. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank you everyone. That is a wrap for the 2021 spring plenary session. Thank you for your participation. We hope to see you in team meetings over the next two weeks, as well as in person later this year. If you did register to attend the team meeting or the special stakeholder or industry sessions later today, you received a separate link for those meetings. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. We are always open to new ideas. So please send me an email with any comments or suggestions you may have. And thanks again and have a great day.